Welcome to the Summercast, a podcast aimed at making fundamentalism great again by applying confessional Baptist doctrine to all of life. Welcome, guys, to the show. Thank you for tuning in. Today, I want to I want to jump back um, to theology proper. Uh, I want to revisit the topic of theology proper, which I haven't done on this show in a little while. Of course, it's laced throughout all of my theology and everything that I talk about, really, um, which uh, has been really circumstantial as of late. Yesterday, I did an episode on uh, what's going on with the uh, uh, the mail-in ballots and the USPS and the potential theft of an election and the theological import of, of that situation. Um, but today I wanna, I wanna go back to theology proper, which is really the basics. It's really the basics, right? Theology proper is something that has garnered a lot of attention over the last several months, really over the last few years even, a couple of years especially. Um, but it's really the bedrock of the Christian religion theology proper. It's really the, the bedrock if you're going back and, and you're talking about metaphysics, it's the bedrock of everything, um, uh, of all creation, right? Um, God is the metaphysical explanation to, to every, uh, every created thing, um, or of every created thing. Um, and uh, God is that unactualized actualizer, to use the language of Edward Fazer. He is uh, the first cause. Uh, behind him, there is no other cause. He is not an effect. He is, uh, he is a cause. He's pure actuality, and um, he is pure being. He is that which brings being to be. He is not derived in any way. Everything is derived from him. So... Um, why do I why do I do this? Why do I jump back to theology proper? Um, lately, at, at our church, I've been preaching through uh, the Epistle of the Hebrews, and um, obviously, there's a lot of import from the Epistle of the Hebrews or to the Hebrews uh, upon covenant theology, um, or upon how we understand uh, the relationships of a, a couple of different covenants one to the other. Uh, specifically the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Um, but one of the reasons I wanted to go back to theology proper, one of the reasons I want to relate theology proper to our discussion on uh, God's covenant relationships with his people is because I think there's a really important uh, facet to the relationship between God as immutable, God as ausse and unchangeable, uh, and impassable even um, uh, to uh, God's covenants and God's people who relate to God through covenant. Uh, and, and that is this. Oftentimes in covenant making, God reveals his part of the covenant and then he re reveals man's part uh, of the covenant. So if you go, for example, to, to uh, Genesis uh, chapter 8, really the end of chapter 8, and um, and the beginning of chapter 9, what you see is this kind of chiastic structure of God's uh, typical uh, covenant-making method. And uh, if you if you look at um, if you look at the end of chapter 8, uh, beginning at verse 20, uh, you'll see that Noah builds an altar to the Lord. Uh, that's kind of an indication that a covenant is about to be made. Um, it's a sweet-smelling aroma, or it's a it's a soothing aroma to the Lord. Uh, then the Lord said in his heart, this isn't revealed to Noah. Noah doesn't know this at this point. Uh, but, but God says in his heart, that means it's secret, it belongs to him alone, except uh, with the exception of the fact that it's revealed in Scripture. It was not revealed to Noah at this time. I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. That is, uh, he will never destroy the world again by water or by a flood. And then you see the formalization of the promise in verse 22, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. In the beginning in chapter 9, it says, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and, fill, and, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, 
and on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs, but you shall need flesh with its life, that is its blood. Surely your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply it in it. Um, Okay, so notice the language, as for you, be fruitful and multiply. As for you, really, one of the stipulations which applies only to man, thou shalt not kill. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. So there's a few duties here in the beginning of chapter 9 given to man, duties which man is responsible to uh, observe and do. And then in verse 8, it says, Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons, saying, uh, or with him, saying, and as for me, okay, so you have you have man's part given. Actually, you have God making a kind of general promise at the end of chapter 8. Then in the beginning of chapter 9, you have man's part given. Be fruitful and multiply. Do not kill. If you kill, your blood will be required. Then in verse 8, you have God's part of the covenant initiated. And what does he say? say he says, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. So or thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh, that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Okay, so you have God's side of the covenant, which is never again to flood the earth, never again to deluge the earth, never again to destroy the earth. Now, the question is, you have God's side, it's immutable, it's never going to fail because God doesn't change what he promises stance. Now, the question in terms of the Noahic covenant, and I think you could ask this question of of other covenants as well, uh, even the Abrahamic covenant, is does man participate in that? And the second question is, how does man participate in that? The answer to the first question is, yes, man does participate in it. This is a covenant made with all flesh, made with all creatures of the earth. So man certainly partakes of these covenant benefits. The second question is, how does he do so? In other words, is it possible for man to not participate in this covenant? Is it possible for man to actually be cut off from the benefits of this covenant? And the answer is yes. If you go back to man's side at the beginning of chapter 9, what you see is a threat of death, uh, a threat of death as the result of man sinning by taking his brother's life, a fellow man's life. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. And this is a universal principle uh, for every culture everywhere, every society around the globe, to have a standard of justice which upholds life by virtue of bringing justice down upon those who would be detrimental or who would otherwise take life, all right? Um, The point here is that, yes, God's covenant to Noah and to all creation stands. God's covenant stands. There's nothing that can destroy or annul that covenant. 
There is something, however, that I can do which should result in me being taken out of this creation, in me being cut off from the benefits afforded by this covenant. And that is, if I kill someone, if I do what Cain did to his brother, I will be cut off through something like capital punishment. All right. And then I do not get to, I don't get to participate in this creation with everyone else. I don't get to witness the perpetuity of, uh, of the beautiful sky and the mountains and all the green things on earth and all the flesh on earth. I don't get to, I don't get to witness that. I don't get to witness God being faithful in not flooding the earth. I'm cut off. I'm essentially taken out of this kind of relationship. Justice or judgment is brought down upon me if I shed another man's blood. Okay, the same thing happens in the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, if you go to uh, Genesis 12, if you look at Genesis 12, Genesis 15, really where the covenant is actually, is actually set forth, and if you go to Genesis 15, I think you'll see, uh, if you go to Genesis 15, I think you'll see what I mean. Sorry about that, I changed, uh, I have all of my, uh, scene selections and all that set up on hotkeys. And, and for some reason, even when my window, my Streamlabs window is not selected, my hotkeys still refer over to Streamlabs and change everything on it. So I apologize for that. Sometimes my when I'm typing something in uh, into Logos or something, I, I lose the scene on, on Streamlabs. I apologize for that. I'll probably just... Uh, I'll probably just uh, end up uh, getting rid of all those hotkeys and not even using them. But anyway, if you go to Genesis 15, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, the actual covenant is cut in verses 17 through 21, and and here is here is really what it here's what it says to your descendants. This is verse 18. To your descendants, I have given the, this land. I have given this land. All right. Um, now, in the Hebrew, it's in the perfect, which means it's good, as good as done. God has given this land to Abraham and his descendants, or to his descendants, properly so-called. So, um, how do we understand that? Because obviously the land wasn't like, the possession, the descendants' possession of the land wasn't actualized here, right? But God says, I have given this land. I have given this land. It's as good as done on my part, right? And then he gives the parameters of the land, the geographical parameters uh, in verses, uh, verse 18b to, to verse 19 and all the way to verse 20, 21 to the end of the chapter. Um, and so on God's part, this is as good as done. But what do we find out in Genesis 17 when the sign of the covenant, that same covenant is given? Uh, the sign of the covenant is circumcision. You see the very beginning of, of chapter 17. But moving all the way to verse 14, God says, And the, circ uh, the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, this is fleshly circumcision. This isn't circumcision of the heart. This isn't spiritual, so-called. This is circumcision of the foreskin. It's a, it's a fleshly circumcision. He says, if that doesn't happen, that person shall be cut off from his people. Well, how are you understand this, on the one hand, this, this promise, which never changes, um, and then all of a sudden, which seems to be unconditional, right? And then all of a sudden, you see conditionality given in the covenant. What, is, it, is the covenant conditional or not? Um, and the answer is yes. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and, I, and I say that, I oversimplify that answer at the risk of conflating law and gospel, which I'm not trying to do. But here, what you see is God giving a promise for earthly land, and he's saying, I have given this to you. Now, the catch is, for individuals to participate peacefully in that covenant, uh, to go in and inherit the land that is given to them, they must obey. And the first, the entryway into that relationship of obedience is circumcision. The entryway into that covenant is circumcision. Fleshly circumcision, not circumcision of the heart. So anyone who is circumcised 
circumcised in the flesh is now a, 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 a an, an heir, if you will, of this land promise. But it goes on, right? Because obviously uh, these people, according to the covenant, these people are exiled and they're taken to Egypt. And they're there uh, peacefully at first, but then not so peacefully after a pharaoh rises up who forgets Joseph. And then the people are in bondage there in Egypt until until uh, until the exodus, really, like 400, some 400 years later. Um, so it's not the immediate descendants of Abraham. It's not Abraham himself who receives the land. It's not the immediate descendants of Abraham who receive the land. Although it is, it's still promised to them. Okay, that's the crazy part. Even though they're dead and gone, as individuals, it's still promised to them. All right, um, because uh, they died in Abraham, so to speak. Abraham's the federal head. So whenever the, as God's redemptive plan progresses, and we see the Mosaic Covenant made, um, which, by the way, is just an expansion of the Abrahamic Covenant. Abraham's still the federal head. Moses doesn't replace him in any way. There's an expansion of laws and, and really parameters set for the nation of Israel that will aid their, uh, their establishment of a government, really, when they come into the land that they're to inherit. But look, there's still Israelites being cut off from the land promise um, before going in. Even Moses himself was cut off from the land promise because he disobeyed God. Okay. Um, And so the question is, well, if the promise is unconditional, uh, then then how is it that these people are are either brought into the land or not brought into the land by virtue of keeping conditions? Well, and I would say this, that the covenant is not unconditional. It's conditional. It's conditioned upon the obedience of the individuals. God's promise doesn't change. It's held out. It's there. However, for an individual to go in and take advantage of the promise and all of those benefits which come in the Abrahamic covenant or the covenant of circumcision, they must obey not only the covenant of circumcision, but also the Mosaic covenant, or they will be cut off. That's the stipulation of the covenant. Um, So on God's part, remember the chiastic structure of God's covenant making method. You have man's part and God's part, or God's part, man's part. God's promise never, never stops. It never goes away. It's held out there. It's, it's, it's there. Remember, He's given the land to Abraham. Now the question is, how do, how do individuals participate in that? And they have to meet certain conditions. The first of which is circumcision, fleshly circumcision, and then Paul says in Galatians three and elsewhere that that, that introduces them really. Uh, to a life of law keeping and they must live according to those laws or be cut off right that's the stipulation of both the abrahamic covenant and the and the mosaic covenant all right so anyways i hope that was helpful in kind of uh in kind of understanding the uh, uh the relationship between god's immutable promise making and uh and and then also a, a person's participation in the benefits of said promise. It's a little difficult to understand, um, and you really won't understand it unless you slow down and and read the text and let the text talk, right? Um, so uh, some of these covenants are very nuanced, they're very detailed, they require a lot of, of attention. And, um, and so, uh, but I think, I think if you understand that that chiastic kind of covenant-making method that God imposes upon man, uh, it's 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 easier to get a hold of what's going on. God, what God's side is always immutable; it doesn't change. However, we can we can change our relationship to it. We can be cut off, right, based on our actions. And when I mean we, I don't. I'm not talking about the new covenant. Um, I'm talking about the old covenant and humanity, uh, specifically the Israelites, as they relate to it, they can be cut off. It's conditional for them. Their participation in the Abrahamic covenant is conditioned upon their obedience. Their participation in the Mosaic covenant, which maintains the same entry point that is circumcision and even has the same promises that is earthly land, for a person to maintain their status in the Mosaic Covenant, they must obey. They must be circumcised, they must go on to obey or or be cut off, all right? 
The new covenant, however, is not like this. And the reason for that is that God changes people so that they are able to, uh, to, to never turn away, so that they're able to persevere and never fall away. All right, and this is the idea of regeneration and being born again. All right, so uh, the new covenant can't be broken. The old covenant, which I believe is both the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant together, that, that covenant can be broken. You're either not circumcised and you're cut off from your people, or you're circumcised and you go on to commit some grievous sin later, and you can be cut off from your people in the case of the Mosaic covenant. That's conditionality. God's promise never goes away. It doesn't change anything about who God is or what God has said. It changes everything about how the person relates to those promises. And that's what we mean when we, when we say that a given covenant is conditional. It's not as if God changes. It's not as if God leaps out from his immutable status of the, as the creator of the universe. Um, it's because we change in relation to God. It's kind of this, again, bringing theology proper into this discussion, I think, is very helpful. When we're talking about, um, when we're talking about God and creatures— Every time, you know, the scripture speaks, which, and it sounds like it's attributing some kind of a change in God, like repentance or uh, regret uh, that he did this or that. Really what's being spoken of there, more so than anything about God himself, is about the status of the creature. The creature can change his relationship to God. God doesn't change. The creature changes not God. All right? And in terms of covenant making, it's the same thing. The covenant stipulations never change. The creature changes his or her relationship to it. Uh, of course, that changes when we get to the new covenant because God actually does something to the creature which enables him or her to keep covenant with God by virtue of having a new heart a renewed mind, etc., etc. So the new covenant cannot be broken. The new covenant cannot be broken. Um, and this is why in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, it, it kind of contrasts the covenant which you broke, you know, going back in time, looking at the old covenant, there's a covenant which you can break, a covenant which has been broken. But there's also this covenant that is going to come about from Jeremiah's perspective that cannot be broken. No longer will people have to teach their brother uh, you know, saying, know the Lord. No longer will they have to teach each other that because they will all, everyone who's in that covenant will know the Lord by virtue of regeneration. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining. If you liked this episode, please press the thumbs up button. If you didn't, press the thumbs down button. Let me know why in the comment section. And don't forget to subscribe. Click the bell for continued notifications. Have a good, wonderful, blessed rest of your day.